so lucky to have Molly Schilling as a member of our club, and she is our club historian. We're looking forward to her speech today and learning a lot. Harris. Uh, this is a picture of him when he was 28 years old. Eighteen ninety-six when he first started working professionally in Chicago. Um, so anyway, that's our man. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a lot about him and about how the the uh, Rotary Foundation grew up. I would like first to dedicate this presentation to my father, who was an engineer, a mechanist, a, a machinist, and an inspiration. Rotary has been around for 107 years. It was born and then grew up over a whole century, like a tiny acorn taking root in a city park. We wonder how it managed to sprout, how it managed to sustain itself in a maze of competing forces. And when it came of age, how it continued to measure up. And at last, how it managed to tower proudly, greatly, so that life knows its presence and the dignity it represents. I offer you some cultural history to consider uh, that will help you enrich your sense of this esteemed club. One day long ago, Paul Harris met his fellow attorney, Bob Frank, for dinner in a well-off neighborhood in the north side of Chicago. They took a walk around the area and stopped at shops along the way. Harris was impressed by how Frank had made friends with many of the shopkeepers. <coughs> Since moving to Chicago to set up his new law practice, Harris had not encountered the kind of camaraderie that he longed for, that Frank enjoyed with his fellow businessmen. He wondered whether there was a way to organize and expand this type of fellowship, which reminded him of the New England town where he'd grown up. This is a quote. The thought persisted that I was experiencing what perhaps could happen for hundreds, even thousands of others in this great city. I was sure that there must be many other young men who had come from farms and small villages to establish themselves in Chicago. Why not bring them together? If others were longing for fellowship as I was, something could come of this. Eventually, Harris persuaded other local businessmen to meet and discuss forming a club for commercial trade, community, and fellowship. Little did he know, his heartfelt vision would see a new and mighty foundation a century later. Paul Percy Harris was born <coughs> to George and Cornelia Harris on 19 April 1868 in Wisconsin. His father endeavored to support his family as a small business owner, but he often relied on his father for financial support. So much so that in July of 1871, at the age of maybe three, Paul, a mere toddler, and his older brother Cecil were sent to live with their paternal grandparents in Wallingford, Vermont. Harris was raised by his grandparents and sadly saw his parents only on the few occasions when they attempted to reunite the family. But in the sheltering care of his grandparents, he grew to revere the family values that characterized the New England of his youth. He commented once in later years, that, and this is a quote, much that there is in Rotary today can be traced back 
to the good old New England family table. <coughs> Eventually, having spent his childhood and adolescence in the warmth and beauty of Vermont, Harris enrolled in the State University. Soon after, he transferred to Princeton. His time at school was cut short, however, by the death of his grandfather in March 1888. Though Harris completed the semester, he did not return for the next academic year. After his grandfather's death, Harris spent a year working for the Sheldon Marble Company back in Vermont. His grandmother encouraged him to work hard and live honorably for his grandfather's sake. Drawn to law, he then spent a year working as an apprentice at a, as, at a law firm in Iowa and then enrolled at the University of Iowa and graduated with a Bachelor of Law in 1891. In 1896, Harris went and settled in Chicago where he opened a law practice in the Central Business District. Harris sought meaningful personal and spiritual relationships in addition to his professional relationships. He customarily attended religious services on Sundays, but visited many different churches rather than aligning himself exclusively with one congregation. Later in his life, he said that his religious affiliations were, like himself, difficult to label. A quote, I really have no church affiliations. I am not easily classified. That is to say, my convictions are not that of a definite nature essential to wholehearted affiliation with the general run of churches. Of course, these days, and this is true back then, one can hear the best of preaching over the radio, and I generally hear three or four sermons every Sunday. Harris loved nature. And in 18, sorry, 1908, he joined a newly formed group that organized monthly Sunday afternoon walking trips through the forest, fields, hills, and valleys around the city. In 1911, the group became the Prairie Club and Harris served as one of their directors. Paul met Jean Thompson. Scottish born daughter of John and Ann Thompson during an outdoor excursion of the Prairie Club. His quote, one beautiful March Saturday in 1910, I joined my fellow Prairians on an Elgin and Aurora electric train bound west. I was a bachelor and quite open-minded on the matrimonial subject. That is to say, I had never closed my mind and heart to the possibility of conjugal bliss. <laughs> Here is where she came in, Blythe Bonnie Jean. After a brief courtship, they wedded on July 2nd in 1910 in Chicago. In 1912, they purchased a two-year, uh, a two-year house on, a two-year, oh, it's two-year-old house on Longwood Drive in Morgan Park which at the time was a suburb of Chicago. The nearby rail lines made it possible for businessmen like Harris to live in the city suburbs and commute to their offices in the city. The Harrises named their house Coney Bank after the street in Edinburgh where Jean had lived as a child. They entertained friends from Chicago and around the world and hosted meetings and reunions of the Rotary Club of Chicago. Weather permitting, many gatherings took place outside in what they referred to as their Garden of Friendship or Friendship Garden. The couple never had children and in the decades to follow, Jean often joined Harris during their travels to Rotary Clubs all over the world. Now back to that first meeting. It was a cold, probably snowy night in February in 1905, when a lawyer, a tailor, a coal merchant, and a businessman gathered in an office in downtown Chicago to discuss the idea of forming a new organization. They later held a second meeting to which they invited a fifth member, 
By the third meeting, which had a greater turnout than the previous ones, the club members had elected their first president. Harris was elected the third president of the Rotary Club in Chicago, a position he held until the fall of 1908. During his presidency, he formed the executive committee, later called the Ways and Means Committee, which met during lunch and was open to any member of the club. The new meeting was the foundation for Rotary's tradition of club luncheon meetings. Toward the end of his club presidency, Harris covertly worked to extend Rotary beyond Chicago. Initially, some club members resisted its extension, not wanting to shoulder the additional financial burden it would involve. Harris and other Rotarians persisted, and by 1910, Rotary had expanded to seven, several other major U.S. cities. Harris eventually recognized the need to form an executive board of directors and a national association. In August 1910, largely because of Harris's work, Rotarians held their first national convention in Chicago. The 16 clubs then in existence unified as the National Association of Rotary Clubs. The new association unanimously elected Harris as its president. Paul had a great ambition for the growth of Rotary, and soon after, new clubs were started first on the West Coast and then all over the United States and Europe. On the 22nd of February in 1911, a Rotary Club was formed in Ireland in 1912 in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, and London had their first charter as well in 1912. During the years of World War I, Britain's clubs include, increased from 9 to 22, and a club was even started in China in 1919. In 1922, the name was changed to Rotary International, and by 1925, Rotary had grown to 200 clubs with more than 20,000 members. And interestingly, by the way, there were six German clubs that were formed after Hitler came to power, but they came under pressure almost immediately to expel their Jewish members. Um, the charter for the German clubs was eventually withdrawn by Rotary International. During the Second World War, Rotary clubs in Eastern Europe and other communist regime nations were disbanded disbanded, but over time, new Rotary Clubs were organized in Russia and the former Soviet satellite nations. Now, I'm going to inject, inject a little thought here, uh, which was inspired by my father. Um, there's a notion that the name Rotary comes from rotating meetings from one member's office to another. There's another notion that the name Rotary comes from the idea of members from a community being like spokes in a wheel, because all different professions were encouraged to become members. But I would like to suggest perhaps a more subtle meaning, and that relates to Rotary motion. Now these, which is a principle of physics, it's a Newtonian principle. These young men, at the turn of the last century, were born into the Industrial Revolution. Cars and trains were becoming a, as, as, as ubiquitous to them as <coughs> iPods are to us. And the engineering principle of rotary motion was a grand mechanical feature of a burdening industrial life. Rotary motion is a principle a Newtonian principle that says that when you have a disk that can turn on an axis, it can be made then to turn other disks. The disks ordinarily in an engineering scheme and as machinists would be fitted with grips or fingers that would intertwine with other disks and their fingers also turning on their own axes. 
Engineers and mechanics in the late 1800s became very inventive in industry by hooking more and more disks up within machines as well as from machine to machine. Rotary motion was at the heart of industry. Sometimes I like to imagine that Paul Harris had some notion of rotary motion in his visions for the expansion of his service-oriented club. And Paul perhaps innately understood the dynamic, and that Paul perhaps innately understood the dynamics of rotary motion, not only that other clubs and eventually strategic partnerships could be engaged to the core disk or rotary of rotary, but that the core disk also had to have a strong axis. Over decades, those leading rotary in those first many years led it into a fuller and fuller social and service club and paid close attention to its existential axis. For example, Rotary's official mottos, service above self, and one profits most who serves best, trace back to the early days of this organization. In 1911, he profits most who serves best was approved as the Rotary model at the second convention of the National Association of Rotary Clubs of America. It was adapted from a speech made by Frederick Sheldon to the first convention held in Chicago the previous year. Sheldon declared that only the science of right conduct toward others pays. Business is the science of human services, he said. He profits most who serves his fellows best. The Portland Convention also inspired the model service above self. During a convention out during a convention outing, there was a discussion about the proper way to organize a Rotary Club. Offering the principal his club had adopted service not self, um, Paul Harris had been invited to join into a conversation with this man. Harris asked Collins to address the, the convention and the phrase service not self was met with, with great enthusiasm because, as he said, it best conveys the philosophy of unselfish volunteer service. Rotary's philosophy continued to develop. Eventually, ethical objectives were formulated to encourage and, for example, to encourage and foster the ideal of service as a basis of worthy enterprise, and in particular, to encourage and foster the development of acquaintance as an opportunity for service. High ethical standards in business and professions, the recognition of the worthiness of all useful occupations, and the dignifying of each Rotarian's occupation as an opportunity to serve society. The application of the ideal of service in each Rotarian's personal, business, and community life was emphasized. The advancement of international understanding, goodwill, and peace throughout the world and world fellowship of business and professional persons united their thoughts in the ideal of service. Decades later, these objectives were further elaborated by the addition of the rotary four-way test used to see if a planned action is comparable with the Rotarian spirit. The test was developed by Rotarian entrepreneur Herbert J. Taylor during the Great Depression as a set of guidelines for restoring faltering businesses. It was formally adopted by Rotary in 1942. The four-way test is considered to be the rotary standard of ethics. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? So to reiterate my point, 
there was always an awareness of the need for a strong axis. And that axis has persisted in the club as, as the heart of the club. It's now December 1945, and the Harrises have traveled to Tuskegee, Alabama for the winter months. Cole had been in ill health and contracted influenza. They didn't return to Chicago until late March in 1946, and in January 1947, Paul Harris died in Chicago at the age of 78. Funeral services were held at Morgan Park Congregational Church on Chicago's south side, and three Rotary leaders spoke at his funeral, and many past presidents of the Rotary Club of Chicago served as pallbearers. By the time of Harris's death, Rotary International had grown to more than 200,000 members in 75 countries. Jean lived on at Coney Bank, but sold the house in 1955 and returned to her native Edinburgh, where she died in 1963. Now, I'm going to add two other, well, actually, two other features of this organization as it blossomed into a grand oak tree by the end of our century in the 20th century. One has to do with female membership. From 1905 until mid-1980s, women were not members of Rotary Clubs. Although Rotarian spouses, including Paul Harris's wife, were often members of, the, of what was considered to be an inner wheel club. Women did play some roles, and Paul Harris's wife made numerous speeches. In 1963, it was noted that the Rotary practice of involving wives in club activities had helped to break down female seclusion in some countries. Clubs such as Rotary have long been predated by women's voluntary organizations, which in fact started in the United States as early as 1790. So in 1976, at long last, the Rotary Club in Duarte, California admitted three women members. After this club refused to remove the women from membership, um, in 1978, Rotary International revoked the club's charter. The California club filed suit in the courts claiming that Rotary clubs are business establishments subject to regulation under California's law, which bans discrimination based on race, gender, religion, and ethnic origin. Rotary International then appealed the decision to the U.S. Supreme Court. You guys are tough. <laughs> The Rotary International argued that the decision to let women in threatens to force us to take in everyone like a motel. Shame, shame. The, the, Duarte, the California Club was not alone in opposing um, the uh, Rotary International leadership. And uh, the Seattle Club unanimously also voted to uh, admit women in 1986. The United States Supreme Court on May 4th, 1987 confirmed the California decision to be valid. Rotary International then removed the gender requirements from its requirements for club charters, and most clubs in most countries have opted to include women as members of Rotary Club. The first female club president was elected in California in 1987, and by 2007, there was a female trustee in the Rotary Foundation, and now female district governors and club presidents are common. Women currently account, I'm not sure this is correct, for 15% of international Rotary membership, 22% in North America. The great flowering of the acorn came with the most notable current global project, Polio Plus. This project is contributing largely to the global eradication of polio. Since 1985, 
Rotarians have contributed over $850 million and hundreds of thousands of volunteer hours inoculating more than 2 billion of the world's children. Inspired by Rotary's commitment, the World Health Organization passed a resolution in 1988 to eradicate polio by 2000, and we know that's been changed. Now a partner in the Global Polio Eradication Initiative with the World Health Organization, UNICEF, uh, the Center for Disease Controls, and the United Nations, um, Rotary is recognized as a key private partner in the eradication effort. In 2008, Rotary received a $100 million challenge grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And in January 2009, Bill Gates announced a second challenge grant of $255 million. Together, the Gates Foundation and Rotary have committed millions of dollars toward the eradication of polio. At the time of the second challenge grant, Bill Gates said, and this is a quote, we know that it's a formidable challenge to eradicate a disease that has killed and crippled children since at least the time of the ancient Egyptians. We don't know exactly when the last child will be inoculated, but we do have the vaccines to wipe it out. Countries do have the will to deploy all the tools at their disposal. If we all have the fortitude to see this effort through to the end, then we will do the job. The Rotary Club is the world's first, sort of first service organization. Because its ethical axis developed slowly and over decades, being tested again and again against the many storms of life, and because its deep and sound traditions have held up, it is our privilege and responsibility to protect and respect the great and strong primary ethical axes of this now worldwide organization as best we can in order to pass them on in their original integrity. Thank you.